good to see each one of you here this morning, and I'm glad that you are here to worship with us in the presence of God as we gather as one spirit. For those of you who are joining us online, we welcome you as well. Uh, there's a little bit of a technical issue this morning, and you won't see the, necessarily the words on the screen very well, uh, but I hope you'll be able to follow along the best you can. Would you open in prayer with me? Lord God, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you this morning. May we set aside the distractions, the things that seem important. May we set aside all that draws us away from you, that our hearts and our minds may encounter you, that our hearts and our minds may be present here with you in this place and in this time. Lord, guide our time together. Speak to our hearts. May we know your grace and your love in deeper and more present ways as we have been together today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our opening scripture this morning comes from Psalm 119. Uh, Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. And we're not going to read the whole thing. Uh, we're not, but we're going to read several verses uh, beginning at verse 137. You are righteous, Lord, and your laws are right. The statutes you have laid down are righteous. They are fully trustworthy. My zeal wears me out, for my enemies ignore your words. Your promises have been thoroughly tested, and your servant loves them. Though I am lowly and despised, I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is everlasting, and your law is true. Trouble and distress have come upon me, but your commands give me delight. Your statutes are always righteous. Give me understanding that I may live. Let us begin to sing together this morning forever. Give thanks to the Lord, our God, our King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us. Forever. The mighty hand that had outstretched arm, his love endures forever. For, for the life that's been reborn, his love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever, forever. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. By the grace of God we will carry on. Love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us. Forever, forever. God of 
of grace and God of glory on thy people for thy power. Crown thy ancient church's story, bring her back to glorious flower. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. For the facing of this hour. Lo, the hosts of evil round us, scorn thy Christ to sail his waves. From the fears that long have bound us, free our hearts to faith and praise. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the living of these days, for the living of these days. Cure thy children's warring madness, bend our pride to thy control. Shame our want and selfish gladness, rich in things and poor in soul. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, lest we miss thy kingdom's goal. Lest we miss thy kingdom's goal. Set our feet. From lofty places, gird our lives that we may be armored with all Christ like graces, pledged to set all captives free. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, that we fail not man nor thee, that we fail not man nor thee. Save us from weak resignation to the evils we deplore. Let the search for thy salvation be our glory evermore. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, serving thee whom we adore, serving thee whom we adore. Love divine, all love's excelling joy. Of heaven to earth come down, fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies proud. Jesus, thou art all compassion, your unbounded love thou art. with our salvation. Enter every trembling heart. Breathe, oh, breathe thy loving spirit into every troubled breast. Let us all in thee inherit. Let us find the promised rest. Take away our bent to city. Alpha and Omega B, and the faith that's its beginning, set our hearts at liberty. Come, Almighty, to deliver, let us all thy grace receive. Suddenly return and never, never more thy temples flee. Thee we would be always blessed. Serve thee as thy hosts above. Pray and praise thee without ceasing. Glory in thy perfect love. Finished in thy new creation, 
pure and spotless, let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee. Change from glory into glory till in heaven we take our place. Till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. Are there prayer requests this morning that you would like to share? We have our prayer list in the back, and it's been emailed out as well. If there are updates, please let us know either this morning or uh, through email or a phone call to the office, and we'll be continuing to update that each week as well as in the bulletin, and we continue to pray for all those prayer requests that have been shared uh, with us. Let us pray together this morning. Gracious God, we do come this morning as your, your people in your house. We thank you, Lord, that in this place we find your presence. We find community with one another. We experience your grace and your love in so many different ways. Lord, we lift before you those who are in need of healing, those who are struggling with illness, colds, flus, COVID, cancer, so many different illnesses that we struggle with in our frail human bodies. Lord, we pray for strength in our weak times. We pray for healing. But most of all, Lord, in the midst of it all, we are grateful that you walk with us through these times. Lord, for those who struggle with anxiety and depression, we lift them before you and just pray for your grace, for your love, your presence during those times. Lord, we lift before you those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. Those who are grieving the loss of jobs, of family, of possibilities, so much that we grieve in our lives. Yet, Lord, we know that you bring us comfort. And our faith family brings us comfort as well. Lord, we pray for our country. In the midst of all that is going on, in the midst of the struggles, the division, in the midst of the violence, in the midst of all that is happening, we pray your presence. We pray for your peace. Lord, for the, for the leaders at all levels of government, we hold them before you. And pray for your spirit to guide and direct them. Lord, we pray, Lord, for your spirit to draw us together. People of, of all faiths, of no faith. Lord, may we come together as your people. May we come together. Lord, for our churches, for the churches here in Dallas, for our church, we just hold them before you. Each one of the, these local congregations, Lord, is, is, uh, has different obstacles and challenges in front of them. We hold them before you, Lord, knowing that each church is made up of, of people. And we pray, Lord, for your unity, not only within the churches in Dallas, but with, within each individual church. We thank you for your presence. We thank you that you use us in ways big and small to 
change the world and shine your light in various places. Lord, we give you thanks for the many blessings that you have given to us. We thank you for the sunshine we have seen this week, and the new growth that is happening around us. We thank you for the new growth that is happening within us. And we ask all of this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning I want to continue our, our sermon series. Uh, it's a sermon series that came out of Easter based upon Jesus' resurrection and how you and I are new creations in the world. We started out uh, the Sunday after Easter talking about that new creation, that in Christ we become new people. The old is gone and the new has come. Last week we talked about how our minds are transformed and changed and how that affects us. What we focus on in our minds and in our thought processes really impacts our reality and the way we interact with one another and how important that is that we intentionally work on changing our minds and our thought processes and allow the Holy Spirit to do, do the Spirit's part in all of this as well. This morning we're going to focus on some of Jesus' words from the Gospel of Matthew. And Jesus is part of, as the Sermon on the Mount, is teaching the people who have gathered there. And he begin, or this is the section that we're going to read today. He talks about not only obedience and what the law means, but then he says, you've thought this way, you've heard these things, you've been taught these things in this way, but I tell you something different. And we're going to focus on what that means and why that's important for you and I today. So if you have your Bibles or would like to follow along on the screen, we're reading in Matthew chapter 5, beginning verse 17. And Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For I truly tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter not the least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the, the least of these commandments and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of, of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to stop there for the, mo for the moment. Jesus dealt throughout his time on earth, really butted heads often with, with the Pharisees and other religious leaders, primarily because of their strict adherence, their strict interpretation of the Jewish law. We often think of the Jewish law as being the Ten Commandments. We might expand that to uh, just those the basic category of writings in the Old Testament, which would be the, the first five books of, of, of the Old Testament as we, as we have it today. But if we look at what the law, law had expanded and, and uh, exploded into, many times the religious leaders, whether they be the priests or the Pharisees, whoever it might be, took the basic concepts of the law. And we'll just, for this sake right now, we'll say the Ten Commandments, because we're familiar with those. And they looked at those and they said, okay, God tells us to keep the Sabbath But what does that mean? What does it mean to keep the Sabbath? And so they, therefore, took that simple idea of making the Sabbath holy, keeping the Sabbath, resting on the Sabbath, and said, this is what it means. There's a lot of different specific regulations 
that meant this is how you keep the Sabbath holy. But also, lots of different loopholes, if you will. And they did that with various different laws. And we're going to talk about some of those here in just a few moments. But I want us to be, really be familiar with that idea that the, the priests, the Pharisees, the religious leaders took the law that had been given to them centuries before and really just exploded it in meaning, in what it meant, in what you could do, what you couldn't do, and loopholes to get around things. And we could go into a lot of those, and we're not going to today. But just understand this, that those religious leaders, those specifics, were very strict. And you could go through your day, and you could say, okay, I, check, I can just go down the list and check them off, like you and I might do with a to-do list. Or if we're putting something together, some furniture or a toy together, we go down the, the instruction list, and we check off each individual step that we've accomplished. And Jesus approaches these people in this text this morning. And he says, I've not come to, to get rid of the law. I'm not going to abolish the law. I'm going to fulfill it. I'm going to make it what it is supposed to be by fulfilling what the law was meant to be originally. Because if we read this, these short verses, Jesus even says, therefore, if anyone sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same, they'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And while this takes place near the beginning of Jesus' ministry, there are several times within the ministry of Jesus where we see Jesus breaking those laws. He healed on the Sabbath. He and his disciples picked grain on the Sabbath. This is a couple of different examples. And in each one of those, Jesus, when confronted with the Pharisee, by the Pharisees, he, he basically said, this interpretation, this regulations, this way of looking at the law that you all have is not correct. And so in saying these words here in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is telling the people that are gathered on this mountainside to hear this, what we call the Sermon on the Mount. They are hearing these words, and we're going to look at five or six different examples then that Jesus uses to say this is what it really means. So these aren't going to be on the screen, but if you have your Bibles with you, just we're going to continue uh, down in Matthew chapter 5. The first one that he, he says is, uh, you have heard it said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Okay. I can pretty much check off, well, I can't check off every day so far that I haven't murdered anybody. I hope you can too. I hope you can check off, I did not murder anybody today. And that's a good thing. Jesus continues, I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, which is a term of contempt, will, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. It's easy to check off and say, I didn't murder anybody today. A lot harder to say, hey, did I get angry with somebody today? Was I angry with somebody without cause today? You know, were my words, did I use my words to attack somebody today? Yeah. See, in this one, Jesus is contrasting that commands, you do, do not murder, 
the more personal condition of the heart. It says anyone who is angry, some translations say angry without cause. Did I use my words to attack somebody today to say, you're a fool? Jesus takes this, this great idea of, of murder and says, make it personal. What's the condition of your heart? It's not necessarily did you kill somebody today, but did you use your words to attack somebody? Did you get angry with them without cause or even with cause and didn't resolve it? Because then Jesus goes on to say, if any of you have a is coming to worship and laying your gift at the altar and realize you have something against somebody else. Or you could even say that you remember someone else has something against you. Leave your gift there and go and make it right. Go and resolve it. Make restitution. Be reconciled together. And then come back. And complete the sacrifice. Complete the gift. Complete your worship. Jesus is telling you and I that what is in our hearts oftentimes can be a barrier in worship. Oftentimes is a barrier between our relationships one to another and our relationship to God as well. He then goes on to say, you have heard it said you shall not commit adultery. Again, another one of the Ten Commandments. And we can think about our day. Okay, I didn't commit adultery. But again, Jesus takes that, that great idea and makes it personal. Takes that wonderful concept and says, what's in your heart? Because he says, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Again, the condition of our hearts is of primary importance here. What's in our hearts? Do we look lustfully at somebody? Do we desire somebody who may not be our spouse? Jesus says to us, this grand idea of don't commit adultery is absolutely important. But it goes much deeper than that. It's a condition of your heart. He continues on. He says, if it has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. And in that time, a man, the husband, could just, for whatever reason, you think our, our system of, of no-fault divorce is, is pretty easy? Husband could give his wife a certificate of divorce and, and send her out. Be gone. I don't want you. I don't want you around anymore. I remember what Joseph did with Mary. He had planned on divorcing her quietly. But he didn't because of what God said to him in that dream. He was, he was perfectly within the Jewish law rights and legalities to divorce Mary quietly. Or loudly, but he was going to do it quietly. But Jesus, in saying this, is not, I don't think he's referring to his earthly father and mother. But he's saying, what is in your heart? He goes on to say, but I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her a victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. I don't want to get into a lot of the specifics here because I know divorce even today is a big struggle. It's a big issue with, within us. And in, in this, we have to always see God's grace and God's love for us because we don't always get it right. But the comparison Jesus makes here is, again, what is in your heart? We know relationships are hard. We know especially marriage relationships are hard. But what is in your heart? 
towards your spouse. The easy part of it is say, hey, here's a certificate, be gone. I mean, today it's a little more complicated like we know. But what is in our hearts? Where is our heart in all of this? Jesus continues. Again, you've heard it said uh, to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. How many times have we heard somebody even today in agreeing to something, you know, I swear on my mother's grave, or I swear on the Holy Bible, or I, you know, I swear on, you know, fill in a lot of blanks there. And we think that makes it more binding. But Jesus says once again, but I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot even make one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond that comes from the evil one. There are two things I want to point out on this one. First of all, is that integrity. The integrity that you and I have to say, yes, I will do this, and then fulfill it. You remember that, that saying, probably from a long time ago, you know, you have my word. And you fulfill that word. But the second thing I want to point out to you too, is sometimes it's okay to say no. If somebody asks you to do something, it's okay to say no. It's okay to say, oh, I can't do that right now. And that's still being, having integrity. It's recognizing your limits, your schedule, where you are. And if you can't fulfill that, if you can't take care of that task, then you say, you know what, I can't do that right now. Thank you. Maybe next time. And not, not feel guilty about that. Not feel wrong about that. But again, it comes down to what's, what's in our hearts. Are we women and men of integrity? Do we let our yeses be yes and then fulfill them? Can we say no without guilt, shame, and with in integrity as well? We don't have to, to swear on heaven, on earth, on whatever. If we are people of integrity, if we, what's in our hearts and our minds is honest and true, then we will be people of integrity. Jesus continues, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's in the Jewish law. Somebody pokes your eye out, you can poke theirs out. Somebody pulls your tooth, knocks your tooth out, you can reciprocate in kind. Can you imagine what we would look like at that point? But you know what, we live like that, don't we? Somebody does something to us whether it be a physical attack, a verbal attack, maybe someone disparages us, somebody hurts us, and our first thought is probably, I gotta get back at him. I gotta get my revenge. I gotta show them I can retaliate. And then once we do, they up it, and then we up it, then they up it. You see how it goes? But Jesus says this. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go two miles with them. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. some pretty hard stuff. Jesus says, don't, don't resist an evil person. Ugh. 
turn the other cheek. Give them more than what they're suing you for. Walk an extra mile with that person without being forced to or asked to. Hard words. But again, it comes down to the condition of our hearts. Are we ones to get revenge, to get our own way, to get what we think we might deserve? Or are we saying to the other person, to the world, it's not about me. I want to show you my heart. I want to show you the love of God. I'm going to show you grace and compassion. And in doing so, we have to act it. We have to show through our actions, which is tough. It's very hard. The last one we're going to look at is uh, the last part of this chapter. Jesus says, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Sounds like pretty conventional wisdom, doesn't it? Love those who agree with you. Love those who are on your side. Love those who are nice to you. But if somebody disagrees with you, if somebody goes against you, if somebody's mean to you, then it's okay to be mean to them. It's okay to be vengeful toward them, to attack them. It's okay to call them names. But I tell you, Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. It's so easy, and we see it so often in our world today, for those who don't agree with us, who may not be like us, we see them as enemies, people who look different from us. We see them as others or as enemies often. And Jesus says, don't, don't do that. Pray for them. Show them comp kindness and compassion. Love your enemies in a very real and personal way. When we say we love somebody, we take care of them, we help them, we do all these different things. Yet it is so important that we do that with, our, with those who might be considered our enemies as well. In all of this, Jesus says, this is the, the law you've heard. This is what you've heard, probably taught your whole lives as, as people who grew up in the Jewish community. And I tell you, take it up several notches. Take it down to the core of the message. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus doesn't get rid of the law, but he fulfills it in a way that makes it what it was supposed to be to begin with. Over the, the centuries, 
the Jewish law had become just a series of checklists. But that's not what it was meant originally. That's not what it's meant today. That's not what it's meant as we look at it as Christ followers. We are called to live as Jesus lived. We are called to be obedient to what Jesus does and what Jesus says. So when he tells us, I tell you, we have to listen. And more than that, we have to be obedient. But I want you to hear this as well. We may not get it right all the time. In fact, we don't get it right all the time. Yet, we have grace. We have love and forgiveness that overwhelms us, that fulfills us in a way that lifts us up, sets us back on our feet and says, okay, Darren, let's try this again. You got mad at the person in line at the store because they cut in line in front of you. And although you didn't say it, Darren, out loud, you were saying things under your breath. Let's try this again. Does that make sense? Do you hear what Jesus is saying to us? He says, you have been taught these things for so long. You need to transform and renew your mind so that you understand really what it's all about. Look at your hearts. Look at the core of what this means. You've heard this, but I tell you this. We're called to follow this. And we grow each day. We struggle with it each day. We wrestle with it each day. And we say, okay, it's not about a checklist. But it's about the condition of our hearts. It's about what God's doing to transform our hearts and our minds and therefore our actions and our words in ways that make a difference in the world today, in a way that makes us more obedient followers of Jesus each step that we take, each way, each word that we use, and each day of our lives. So when somebody says to you, this is what it should be, look at what Jesus says. He says, this is what I tell you. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for today. We thank you for these words spoken so long ago. Words that are absolutely important for us today. Lord, help us to hear these words of Jesus. Help us to hear what you tell us each day. That beyond the rules and the regulations and the things of society tells us are okay. Let us hear the words of the Spirit reminding us of Jesus, of love and compassion, and of encouraging and lifting each other up. Help us to remember to love not only our friends, but, our, but those we might consider enemies to check the condition of our hearts and our minds each and every day. And Lord, may you continue to transform us. Change us and transform us in ways that we can't even possibly imagine at this time, but that will glorify you above everything else. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. we prepare our hearts for communion this morning. If, if you're at home, I hope you've gathered communion supplies together. And if you're here, 
and need community supplies, uh, let us know. We'll be glad to get those for you. Uh, there's a song that was written um, back in the mid-90s. It's called Holiness, and it's a little chorus that you all may be familiar with. And it's a chorus that is a prayer, a uh, prayer that really fits what we've been talking about the last several weeks. So as we prepare our hearts for communion this morning, uh, I encourage you to sing with us. I encourage you to follow along the words if you're not familiar with it. It's easy to pick up on. Yet it's a song that is a prayer, and may it be our prayer today. Holiness. Holiness is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. Holiness, holiness is what you want from me. Take my heart and form it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my will, conform it to yours, to your soul. Faithfulness, faithfulness is what I long for. Faithfulness is what I need. Faithfulness, faithfulness is what you want from me. Take my heart and form it. Take my mind. Form it. Take my will, conform it to yours, to yours, O oh Lord. Righteousness, righteousness is what I long for. Righteousness is what I need. Righteousness, righteousness is what you want from me. Take my heart and form it. Take my mind and form it. Take my will and to yours, to yours, O oh Lord. Each week as we come to the table, all are invited to come and to join us. For it is Christ who invites us to this table today. I remember growing up, times of family dinners, whether it was Thanksgiving or Christmas or Sunday dinner, um, even weekday normal times, where we gather with, with my immediate family or my extended family with cousins and aunts and uncles and all manner of people. And how impactful and how fun those times were. And sometimes how ordinary they were as well. We gathered around a table to share a common meal, to talk, to share, and to eat together. When Jesus call called his disciples uh, near the end of his life, he said, go and prepare the Passover. And the, Jew, the, the disciples were no, used to that. They had grown up sharing the Passover with their family, their friends. And when Jesus told them to do that, 
They gladfully and, and went and did that. And Jesus took this regular meal that they had participated in throughout their lives, and he gave it some new meaning, some new meaning that is impactful and important for you and I as well. Because during the meal, Jesus took a loaf of bread from the table, common loaf that they had used in the meal. And he held it before them, and he said, this bread is my body, which is given for you. Whenever you eat of it, remember me. Then he passed the bread around, and each of them took, took a little bit of it and ate it. When the likes of Peter and John and Judas and Matthew and the others had finished eating the bread, Jesus then took a cup from the table. And again, he held it before them and he blessed it. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sin. The disciples understood the covenant of blood because the Passover was the remembrance of putting the blood over the doorposts in Egypt. The disciples were very aware of the importance of that in their history. And when Jesus took that and said, this is the new covenant in my blood, it changed it for them. It no longer became about that Passover lamb, but it became about Jesus, his blood, and his sacrifice that he was giving for all of humanity. And it wasn't about just that night or just those men gathered there together, but it was for all of us. He says, whenever you drink of this cup, remember me. And again, he passed the cup around, and all of them drank from it. Gracious God, thank you for this gift, for this gift of remembrance, for this gift of new life that we have within you. Lord, may you continue to fill us, may you continue to move within us in ways that transform our hearts and our minds, that continue to help make us more faithful followers each day of Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Each week, I know you hear me say these words, but our offering is very important for us, for the life of the church, for the ministry that we are involved in, for the things that we do not only locally here in Dallas, but throughout the world as well, as we participate in outreach and in giving as the church body. Our offering box is at the back as you leave, or you can give online at dallasfirstcc.com if there's steps to walk you through that. I want to encourage you this morning to give as joyful and, and uh, grateful people, people of God that we are. May God bless the givings that we give. May God bless the things that uh, you share, whether it be financial or otherwise, uh, for the life of the church. Because we give them in God's name, and we give them for God's glory. I encourage you to give this morning as people of God here today. There's a few other announcements for us as we move forward. Uh, there's a new, there's a couple new events this week. Uh, the Women's Bible Study starts this week. And I thought I saw Audrey here this morning. Oh, okay. Audrey, Cam Audrey Cameron will be leading the women's Bible study. It's a weekly Bible study that, that's a, going to be Wednesday morning at 930 here at the church. And they'll be starting the Gospel of John. And we encourage you to women to be here for that and to uh, participate in that. Marcia? Okay, so uh, I know Audrey's excited about it, and we look forward to seeing you ladies here 
Uh, for those who can be, I know it's, it's in the middle of the day. For th those who work may not be able to be here for that. Uh, but we encourage you to be here and be excited about what is going to be happening through the Gospel of John. Uh, men's Bible study is, is Thursdays at 8.30. Uh, we get up a little bit earlier. Um, I'm not sure that, that doesn't make us any better, but it just keeps us a little bit, bit earlier. Uh, but we encourage men to come and be a part of that, uh, to study with us as we, as we meet together at 8.30 on Thursdays. And there's also a potluck after dinner, after service this morning. I didn't get this right yet. Uh, so we encourage you, if you brought food, great. If you didn't bring any food, we got plenty. And so come and join us or stay and, and be a part of just a fellowship potluck together as we uh, eat together, as we gather around tables and share one with another as well. Uh, prayer brochure and family visitor are, are in the back as you leave. The family visitor is new, and so we encourage you to pick one up. If you, have, if you get one uh, online through the email but still want a hard copy, they're, they're back there. And then uh, Zoom and prayer and check-in are continue to happen on, on Wednesday and Friday mornings, or at noon, actually. Uh, last, our food collection was 72 pounds this past week, this past time. Uh, had a lot, again, had a lot of different variety of, of things that people brought. Uh, so that's great. And the people at the food bank are excited to receive we see the variety of, of food and other supplies and things that are there. Uh, National Day of Prayer is happening this coming Thursday at uh, noon in front of the, the county courthouse out there in that, that commons area. So we encourage you to come out uh, about noon. The uh, service will actually start about 10 after, quarter after, give people a chance to get there. Half hour, and uh, we'll be praying for our country, our city, our, our state, our world, uh, different leaders, schools, first response, I mean, a lot of different things people will be praying for. So we encourage you to come out for that and to participate in that with the city of Dallas together. Uh, also, save the date. Uh, the one service, we'll be doing that again the end of June. Uh, the service where everybody gathers at the football stadium and all the different churches here in Dallas, or most of them, will be uh, leading and participating in that. We're hoping to have over a thousand people this this next year, or this next time, and it's, it's a wonderful time of not only fellowship but worship together as the one church in Dallas. Uh, you've heard been heard about the the office remodel. This is a couple pictures: uh, Marsha and Amanda and, and Jim and Nelda and Mary Alice and several others who worked hard yesterday, and we did some on Friday as well to to get some of these put together and, and set up. So you, that's a picture of of the office as you come in. That, that door there, they're still a little messy. We, we're working on it. And this is looking the other way. So it looks very different. Instead of having that, that big wall that was up there, this looks much more open and inviting. So we thank you for all the work that you did to help put those together. Yes, yes, which will be good. You don't have to stand there and wait, or, do, or you can sit and talk. So that, those are great. And that, that was one of the things we really wanted to have in there is places for people to sit uh, in there. So other announcements that I may have missed this morning. Would you stand then this morning? Oh. That's right. Now many of you may uh, uh, remember Merle Bittacoffer uh, from pre-COVID. Uh, he passed away a few weeks back and his service is Friday. Uh, so we encourage you, if you'd like to, to, to be a part of that, it's at the... the Tribute Center down here, just off of Washington Street. Uh, so, thank you, Marsha, for that reminder. Would you stand as we sing this morning? Again, our closing song this morning is a is a, a declaration and a prayer that says we are going to follow Jesus wherever He leads. Where you go, I'll, I'll go. go. Where, Where you stay, I'll stay. stay. When, when you move, I'll move. I will follow. All your ways are good. All your ways are sure. I will trust in you alone. Higher than my sight. High above my life. 
I will trust in you alone, in you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. Who you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. I will follow you. Like unto the world and unto my life, I will live for you alone. You're the one I see, knowing I will find all I need in you alone. In you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. Who you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this is life I lose, I will follow you. I will follow you. In you, there's life everlasting. In you, there's freedom for my soul. In you, there's joy unending joy. And I will follow where you go, I'll go. Where you say, I'll say. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. Who you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. I will follow you. May you go in peace. Having heard Jesus say, this is what I tell you, and being willing to live that out every day, may you go in peace.